finally, the Teflon is falling off the Teflon Don. The Madison Square Garden Puerto Rico is garbage disaster is not only not going away, it is still getting worse with the news that Trump staffers vetted that statement and the tasteless reference to Latinos entering the country and the rest of the Tony Hinchcliffe comments and that Tony Hinchcliffe's comments originally included a line in which he dropped the C word in describing Kamala Harris. The news site The Bulwark is reporting that and that Trump staffers directed Hinchcliffe to take the C word out, but that they somehow missed all the anti-Hispanic material, or as they have now claimed, Hinchcliffe ad-libbed all that, even though the video clearly shows him reading his material off the same teleprompter everybody else at the Garden used on Sunday. Day three of Trump's self-immolation among Hispanic voters who make up 12 percent of the electorate one week before the election and no sign that it, like every previous racist Trump controversy, is actually abating. Still the lead story at The New York Times. And at one point, The New York Times had six front page stories about it. Still the front page story at The Washington Post and on the Fox News talk shows and at The Wall Street Journal and at the ultra conservative Washington Examiner. And when the Trump campaign's defense is, well, at least he didn't call her a rhymes with bunt like he planned, they have actually stepped neck high in it, especially since the pro-Trump pack run by Elon Musk posted tweets based on the C word, literally tweets that say the C word. Even the fig leaf, usually accepted by the both sidesist media, looking for a way, some way, any way, to avoid slamming Trump, has opened up a whole new line of stories itself. The disingenuous statement from the conveniently reappearing Latina spokesperson disavowing the jokes only served to spin off a series of further reports on all the other remarks Hinchcliffe and the others made Sunday at Madison Square Garden, from the line about African Americans and watermelons, and the line calling the vice president's staff pimp handlers, to everything that that man Stephen Miller said. And the story is still expanding. Joe Rogan and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. have been sucked under. David Korn of Mother Jones notes that Kennedy is so tied to Puerto Rico, he was once arrested there alongside Al Sharpton and the actor Edward James Olmos protesting naval bombing exercises. And he gave one of his children, one of his children we know about, the middle name Vieques. Kennedy spoke after Hinchcliffe did at Madison Square Garden. He said nothing about the Puerto Rico garbage shot. And when Corn got hold of Kennedy, Kennedy said he was unaware of it. He would have said something had he known. When pressed to take the opportunity to say something about it now, he said, I think it was unfortunate. And he promptly hung up the phone on Corn. Kennedy's sad five words remain the closest thing to regret that anybody actually known to be involved with the Trump campaign has uttered. And that, too, has become a story, as all the news outlets who have hesitated all these years to just ask Trump's enablers what they think of his latest hate or his latest threat or his latest lie are all doing so about this. Musk, no comment. Junior, no comment. Eric doesn't know where he is. Oh, right. Junior did retweet the video of all that stuff. Tulsi Gabbard doesn't know where she is. Lara, no comment. Melania, that's not in her contract. Tucker Carlson, not even a maniacal laugh. It fell to JV to say something. And of course, J.D. Vance said something stupid, saying he hadn't seen the joke. Maybe it's a stupid racist joke, but he doesn't know and he hasn't seen it. And he's not going to comment on it as he continued to comment on it. But, quote, we have to stop getting so offended at every little thing in the United States of America. I'm just I'm so over it. And one wonders if he would feel that way about a rally with jokes about men who wear eyeliner or who have sham marriages just to pick two topics, two comedy standards at, at random, comedy standards that I, I haven't seen and can't comment on. If Vance is really over it, he may be the only one. Now, the entire Hinchcliffe Latinos Puerto Rico story has mainlined back to Joe Rogan. Thanks to the independent journalist Jacqueline Sweet, we have this.
it would behoove him to hire a few great comics to just tour with him and just write oh one-liners about all these different f***ing people. I mean... If he could remember them, I mean, oh I, I know God. he likes to go off his own head, but sure. if he could remember a few Hinchcliffe bangers, <laughs> if he hires Hinchcliffe to take him on the road... <laughs> <laughs> Analysis of why this has stuck to Trump the way other stories had not is largely irrelevant, if not meaningless. But there is a bottom line here that may be operating on an unconscious level with tens of millions of Americans all at the same time. It is one word that Hinchcliffe used because that one word was also a word Trump used again and again last week in Arizona. There's literally a floating island of garbage in the middle of the ocean right now. Yeah. I think it's called Puerto Rico. We're a dumping ground. We're like a we're like a garbage can for the world. That's what's happened. That's what's happened to our, We're like a garbage can. You know, it's the first time I've ever said that. And every time I come up and talk about what they've done to our country, I get angrier and angrier. First time I've ever said garbage can, but you know what? It's a very accurate description. Garbage. Three times. There has not been time to poll on the damage to what had been Trump's unprecedented support from Hispanic voters. As I mentioned yesterday, her polling advantage among them, per ABC News over the weekend, had grown from 12 points on October 1st to 30 points ahead of Trump on October 27th. The first poll that shows what the Madison Square Garden event did to those few remaining Trump Hispanic voters and his support in general will, of course, extend the story into a fourth day or fifth day or sixth day. It is likely to still be front of mind on Election Day. All in all, what could be the final, God help me, vibe shift before Election Day is clearly in Harris's favor. The Tufts University Cooperative Election Study, closing last Friday, has her ahead by four, 51 to 47, among likely voters in their model, by six, 52 to 46, among those who say they have voted or definitely will vote. Nate Silver, again, of use when he's just crunching batting averages or Google searches, reports that there was more searching for Trump after the garden disaster than at any other time online since the guy showed up on Trump's golf course. And for hours, Tony Hinchcliffe got more Google searches than Taylor Swift. Guessing here, little of what popped up helped either of them. There is so much of... God help me. Vibe shift towards Harris that even the New York Times has noticed. Quoting, officials within the Harris campaign and people with whom they have shared candid assessments believe she remains in a solid position in the northern blue wall states of Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, saying internal polling shows her slightly ahead in all three, though by as little as a half a percentage point. They think she remains competitive across the four Sunbelt battleground states. Arizona and North Carolina appear to be the toughest swing states for Ms. Harris, these Democrats said, and they feel better about Georgia and Nevada. This jibes with what I've heard of those candid assessments, with the caveat that my quote-unquote sources are pretty peripheral, and also, more importantly, could easily completely overlap with some of the ones talking to the Times. As to the Trump campaign, well, Clearly, they still have an out-of-control dumpster fire going. All right. What is it you keep in dumpsters again? I guess they just trashed their own momentum into the dustbin of history, or as they say, and by they I mean Tony Hinchcliffe and his pal Donald Trump, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> Only happy when it rains. As in fitting irony, Kamala Harris takes the podium today at the ellipse from which Trump escalated himself from nightmarish lame duck to active lethal threat to the republic amid the little seventh grader teases about Trump's secret with Mike Johnson. As our brethren in the Northwest warm their hands by the fires of the burning ballot drop boxes, as all that happens, thoughts naturally turn to the next Trump coup attempt, and there will be one. 
For months, it has been evident that Trump world is being guaranteed a victory to gin them up for insurrection again, that Mike Johnson would enable that and he would be wearing a military uniform by sunset if they can find one in the boys' department at TJ Maxx. But of all the things to fear, the most publicized is the least realistic. Professors Lawrence Tribe, Neil Buchanan, and Michael Dorff, Michael Dorff of Cornell, by the way, have written a somewhat labored piece for the Washington Post, the gist of which is, no, you don't need 270 or more electoral college votes to become president. And no, just because nobody gets 270 or more electoral college votes, that does not trigger a so-called contingent election in which the congressional delegation of each state gets one vote for president and the Republican always wins the end. Quoting them, the relevant language in the 12th Amendment is admirably clear. The person having the greatest number of electoral votes shall be the president if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed. If that majority is not achieved, the House would properly decide the election, the professors write. There are only two situations in which that could happen, both highly unlikely. First, there could be a tie vote in the Electoral College. Second, a third party candidate could take enough electoral votes from the top two to prevent anyone from winning a majority of electors. One plausible scenario, they continue, involves Harris winning all of the swing states except North Carolina and Georgia and thus besting Trump 287 to 251. Suppose that Trump then succeeds in preventing the appointment of any Pennsylvania electors. Harris should still win 268 to 251. This is where an accurate reading of the 12th Amendment comes in. It doesn't matter that Harris's 268 votes would not be a majority of the full 538 electoral college votes. The amendment says the victor must receive a majority of the whole number of electors appointed, not that could have been appointed. In this example, she would win by virtue of having received a majority of the 519 votes cast after Pennsylvania's were discarded. The professors note that there are still nightmare scenarios spinning off of this one that they have just banished. Not hold up Pennsylvania's electors, but flip them to Trump or hold up Pennsylvania's electors and Arizona's and Wisconsin's so that there are no votes from any of those three states and Trump has a majority of all the rest. And congratulations, you've stolen the election. I'll note, though, that you've also touched off civil war, having overlooked one critical detail. The party of the president-elect from whom the election was just stolen would still be running the government and law enforcement and running... What's the name of that place in uh, Virginia? The the Pen Pentagon? Also of interest here, it is not enough to threaten supposedly impartial journalists with retribution if they criticize Trump or fail to bury critical stories about him or both sides them into meaninglessness. You must also reward them when they do these things. And so we have the story of a constantly self-humiliating stenographer at CNN who, during the Biden-Trump debate, encapsulated everything that is wrong with news in 21st century America. So who got the big profile in the big newspaper yesterday claiming this is that person's moment? Why, that same constantly self-humiliating stenographer. Who else? That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. on this edition of Countdown. So why, if Rudy Giuliani has any sense that Trump ruined his life, if Trump's lies literally just caused a court order 
that Rudy turn over his apartment in New York to the election workers he slandered in Georgia. And if the man Giuliani has long blamed for keeping him from becoming president, Joe Biden, is not even on the ballot next Tuesday, why? Why was Rudy Giuliani at Sunday's Nazi Trump rally at Madison Square Garden? Well, first of all, Rudy now lives in a hallway at Penn Station underneath Madison Square Garden, so he only had to get up the one flight of stairs. But I have long argued here that though it looks like Rudy was sane and went crazy, actually, based on my firsthand experience with him, he was always crazy. He simply used to have and has since lost the ability to pretend he is sane. I experienced this first nearly 30 years ago at a baseball event. They had me MC on the steps of City Hall in New York where Rudy acted like a malfunctioning robot. But the other day, a World Series story I had forgotten popped back into my head. I think this was at Shea Stadium in 2000. And I can't remember if it was after the Mets won the National League pennant or it was after the Yankees won the World Series. But in either event, we were doing the post-game show on Fox from a little roped-off area inside one of the locker rooms. And for several segments, I could see Rudy hovering at the fringes, waiting to be asked to join us on a national broadcast. Oh, here's the most important person in the room, baseball fans, a mayor. Remember, this is pre-9-11. Finally, during a commercial break, seconds before we came back into the studio that we had created for ourselves in the Mets or Yankees locker room, an aide leaned in and whispered something to Rudy, and Rudy promptly jumped over the rope, over the velvet rope. I didn't know he could do that. And the aide produced a chair from somewhere and put it next to me, and Rudy, uninvited, sat down next to me and grabbed one of the handheld mics on the floor and said to me, Hi, I'm Mayor Giuliani. And I said, I know we've met. We, we did a whole event together. And he sat there through the entire segment while we interviewed a Mets player and totally ignored him. We ignored him in large part because of what I'd been through with him five or six years earlier. See, here's the point. Rudy was desperate, is desperate, will always be desperate. Trump ruined his life? So what? Trump's giving him time on stage. I fully expect after Giuliani finally shuffles off, there will be a camera crew at his graveside someday, and his arm will shoot out of the ground like at the end of the movie Carrie, only instead of trying to grab another victim, it will be holding a microphone pointing back towards the grave so Rudy can keep talking. The real Rudy Giuliani story coming up in Things I Promise Not to Tell. Happy World Series. First, there are still more new idiots to talk about, the daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. LeBron's worst? Well, since we're on the subject, Trump. This is from nearly two weeks ago, and I'm sorry I didn't bring it up sooner. But as you know, all too well, the big pile of Trump spit gets so high that it falls over on a weekly basis, proving that gravity exists. This just got lost in the pile. This was at one of his, you know, Chautauqua tent shows. This one was in Greenville, North Carolina, in which he explained that the members of the Border Patrol Agents Union told him he was the best president ever, sir. Better than George Washington and better, sir, than Abraham Sir Lincoln, sir. Because the border agents supposedly told him, sir, that you're better, sir, on the border, sir, than Lincoln was, sir. There are, what, five six things Lincoln did that no other American president, maybe no other world leader has ever done. I mean, I think it's fair to say that maintaining the border of the United States of America successfully at all costs was one of those things that nobody else has ever done. I believe that was the original issue in that whole civil war thing, unless that was just because woke. Honestly, I think this way more often than I say it. On top of everything else going on in that vast, unexplored, lethal jungle between his ears, there are moments when I think that Trump gets up there half the time stoned out of his gourd. Runner-up worser, Caroline Kitchener, a writer for the Washington Post. Nothing against Caroline Kitchener. She just went into the most detail. 
Jake Tapper said this too. Other people at the Post said this too. Other journalists said this too. The argument she and the others have made was that when readers responded to the Washington Post's irresponsibility and disgrace by censoring its own pro forma endorsement of Harris, when they responded by canceling their own subscriptions, Caroline Kitchener wrote, when you cancel, you are hurting us, not our owner. I admit we should be boycotting Amazon and the Washington Post. Maybe that'll sentence Jeff Bezos to a fate worse than life with Lauren Sanchez. But Ms. Kitchener's message, don't blame us, we're only employees, is wrong at its core. I mean, first of all, it sounds like we're just following orders. But more practically, lots of people quit the LA Times when they did this. Lots of people have quit the Washington Post when they did this. And the people who stayed there are covering up for Jeff Bezos, who clearly did this. This British exile they brought in to run the paper into the ground. Lewis, he's lying about this, clearly. You have to stand for something, sometime. I understand quitting your job is an extreme measure, especially in a time in which your industry is evaporating. You will note I will never criticize people for not quitting their jobs if their circumstances don't provide them with a safety net. But don't criticize the customers because they no longer trust the company you work for. It's certainly more your fault than it is the customer's fault. I mean, this is personal for me too. I once worked for Rupert Murdoch. It was hardly my fault he's the devil. On the other hand, I signed up for it. They didn't force me to take the millions. If anything, as anything but a subservient employee, I probably took a few days off Rupert Murdoch's life and I'm proud of that. I'm goddamn proud of that. And by the way, the reason I stopped working for him was when I tripped over a sports story that was about him selling the L.A. Dodgers, I went to his office first for guidance. It was a business conflict. It was a conflict between his baseball business and his TV sports business. And if they had said to me, kill the story, I would have. He owned the network. It was his candy store. He owned the ball club. There was his other candy store. Now, I might have quit after that. I don't know. But they didn't say kill it. His PR person, his personal full-time PR person, crafted a denial and said, as long as you run this along with your story, if your reporting is solid, go ahead. That's what we hired you to do. And then Rupert saw the story on the air and fired me for having followed his rules. The problem, Ms. Kitchener, is that Jeff Bezos has clearly proven himself to be a weather vane. Last time, the interest of the Washington Post collided with his other business interests, his money that he was going to have to give his wife when they tried to blackmail him over Lauren Sanchez, and he defended the Post. He's not going to make that mistake again, is he? If you think his killing the endorsement is not the start of how he will compromise the newspaper next time and eventually compromise you, you're being naive. Turns out Ms. Kitchener is the beat reporter on the abortion news beat. You think if Trump comes to Jeff Bezos and says, I've got a $3 billion interstellar space, let's go to the planet Andromeda in this galaxy of Skyron project for you, but I don't want any more coverage of the pro-abortion protests? You think your job isn't going away, Ms. Kitchener? Devote your energies not to criticizing those readers who have left your platform, but towards joining them. Bezos has destroyed your platform. Find a new one before your platform collapses beneath you. And incidentally, you have my sympathies. Caroline Kitchener's story came onto my radar because she wrote, quote, My mom just told me she canceled her subscription to the Washington Post. She reads every one of my stories. It was a heartbreaking call. I understand why she did it, but I asked her to reconsider. Oh, God. Honestly, though, if mom thinks your employer sucks, listen to mom. New paper. But not the Wall Street Journal, because our winners, the Wall Street Journal. And writer Isabella Simonetti, and CNN's David Shalian, and CNN's Dana Bash. They have combined to bring us what might be the dumbest article I have ever read about TV news. Dumber even than, say, the 50 dumbest articles I've read just about myself. The title, CNN's Dana Bash, a trusted political referee, is having a moment. 
She won kudos from Trump and landed a major Harris interview, but says it has been a slow climb to the top. Wasn't Major Harris a quarterback somewhere? Or was he an anchor? Major Harris, I know that name from somewhere. In what world, though, are kudos from Trump a positive? I mean, Trump wants his mobs to kill everybody at CNN. What does a kudo, or if you prefer kudo, from Trump about a CNN talking head mean? Does it mean Trump wants them to kill her last? It means he views her as favoring him as breaking the rules for him, as benefiting him, as cheating for him. If Trump likes you, it means you have broken some law or moral code. Congratulations, Trump likes you. And for once in this case, he's right. Dana Bash is not having a moment. She and Jake Tapper and CNN permanently stained themselves by participating in a presidential debate in which they let one candidate lie nonstop for 90 minutes. And as she's quoted in the piece saying, she still thinks that was the right route to go. Her reaction to Trump's lies as a journalist on her network, on her show, were to say, we'll be right back after this commercial. Of course Trump likes her. She's a Trump enabler. But this is a Murdoch paper, the Wall Street Journal. So here's this article about her that skips lightly by that and also by her next journalistic self-immolation, her response to Kamala Harris's town hall on CNN last week. The vice president was still on stage when Dana Bash piped in from the anchor desk with how, quote, people she was talking to had said Harris had failed in her goal to seal the deal or finish the sale or whatever cliche she used. We have no idea to this day who those people were. No identification at all. Politicians? Shoeshine men? Democrats? Republicans? Trump family members? People in the control room? Passers-by? There have been few journalists to fail to understand the essence of their job more spectacularly in consecutive gigantic showcases than Dana Bash. But because CNN and the Journal are trying to suck up to Trump right now, we get this crap. Just to sell the thing further, the Wall Street Journal reporter interviewed as somebody to get a quote from CNN's political director, the equally inert incompetent, amoral David Shalian, who is still defending the CNN farcical town hall with Trump a year ago, who said, quote, this is just Dana's cycle. She has just owned it. Shalian, Isabella Simonetti, The Wall Street Journal, and Dana, Dana, if this is your cycle, uh, take a look carefully. The wheels fell off. Bash. Two days. Worst persons per cycle in the world! To the number one story on the countdown and my favorite topic, me and things I promised not to tell. I hear this question about Rudy Giuliani a lot. When did his life go so horribly, horribly wrong? Here was America's mayor, the rock in the hours of crisis after 9-11. What is he now? After literally years of trying to sell the Hunter Biden laptop story, who does the Hunter Biden laptop story bite? Him. Four seasons gardening. The mascara running down his face. Gaseous emissions at phony election hearings. The Sasha Baron Cohen film. I mean, even back then, I thought it was nuts that people actually thought Rudy Giuliani was the front runner for the 2008 Republican presidential nomination, while he was widely held to be just that in 2006 and 2007. And by the time it happened, he was already on his way to spending millions of dollars to finish last. But it was the final nail in the coffin in which he still lives. 
at a Democratic debate in 2007, October 30th, before the field shook out everybody but Obama and Hillary, one of the other candidates was excoriating the Republicans and their exploitation of terrorism and the Al-Qaeda attacks. And that other candidate said of Giuliani, quote, there's only three things he mentions in a sentence, a noun, a verb, and 9-11. The candidate was Joe Biden. The phrase, a noun, a verb, and 9-11 ended Rudy Giuliani's career, and Giuliani's dislike of Joe Biden, many decades old, turned to hatred at that exact moment, which is why we got to where we got to in 2020. That was also the exact moment at which any hopes Giuliani had of being elected anything anywhere ever again vanished. But it was clear to me as far back as September 2001 that sadly what we saw at that time was a bad man having a few good days. Before that month was out, Giuliani's response to the attack on democracy was to himself attack democracy, to propose that the November election to choose his successor to be mayor of New York should be postponed, or that at least he should stay on for a few months as co-mayor, because he was irreplaceable. There had always been more subtle hints that Giuliani was never a good man, just a slightly smarter one, a more devious one. The venomous Rudy, the scheming Rudy, the amoral Rudy, the Rudy with a bad song in his heart, leaked out from time to time and often inside the world of sports, which is where I met him. You will remember, Rudy Giuliani was a professional New York Yankees fan. He always went to the games for free, mind you, dugout seats for himself, his wife, his other wife, his next wife, the kids, the friends. When I still had friends in Yankee Stadium, they estimated Rudy used to cost them thousands of dollars every time he showed up. He always left via the clubhouse. He always wore a Yankees cap. He billed himself as, quote, the number one Yankee fan. And then when the Boston Red Sox were playing in the 2007 World Series, when he was campaigning for president in New Hampshire, Rudy Giuliani suddenly announced he was rooting for the Red Sox. This is like being a Trump fan and announcing you are rooting for democracy. But I went back with Rudy Giuliani even longer than that. In 1995 or 1996, I was asked by the deputy mayor of New York City, Fran Reiter, and the staff of the Baseball Hall of Fame to travel from ESPN in Connecticut, literally to the steps of New York City Hall, to MC an event for what must have been 35 members of the Baseball Hall of Fame, maybe the largest group of them ever assembled in one place in one moment in time. The deputy mayor approached me and the mayor a few steps behind her on that gorgeous spring day. As she began to introduce us, she realized he had begun to wander off. Rudy? Rudy! She bellowed. He wandered back. Rudy, this is Keith Olderman from ESPN. He's going to be the MC. You will have to introduce him after you speak. The mayor seemed to be having trouble focusing on me or anything else. I thought of the old joke, just, just keep your eyes on the Olbermann in the middle. He extended a hand, missed mine, then recalibrated. As we shook hands, he grunted. The deputy mayor now roared at him. Brody, you have to introduce him. His name is Keith Olbermann from ESPN. He's the MC. Giuliani turned and looked at her like he'd never seen her before. He grunted again. Deputy Mayor Reiter now screamed at Rudy Giuliani. Repeat it to me! He looked at me, then he looked back at her, and he said, His name is Keith Alderman from ESPN. He's the MC." With annoyance, Reiter said, Thank you! And Giuliani smiled and wandered off again. And I half seriously thought, Did I just meet a body double? Is he a replicant? You see a well-built robot? This can't be the actual mayor. Well, it was. I took my seat in the front row of the stage that had been built atop the city hall steps as the crowd gathered, and it was a good one, maybe three or four hundred people. The president of the Hall of Fame spoke first. The mayor sat next to me. Giuliani leaned in at one point and whispered to me, Your name is Keith Olverman from ESPN. You're the MC. I talk. 
I introduce you. I said something encouraging, and he smiled broadly like a child who was about to get some candy. The president of the Baseball Hall of Fame wrapped up, introduced Giuliani, who bounced up to the stage and thanked him and got his name wrong. He then launched into a speech taking credit for the great weather and the terrific early season performance of the New York Yankees and the New York Mets and the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Giants who had moved out of New York in 1957. But if he had been mayor, then they wouldn't have moved out and New York would have the four teams it deserves. And look at all these great players. Let me now turn it over to a good friend of mine and a great baseball man. And he looked at me and he forgot everything. Silence titters of laughter from the crowd. And finally, he looked the other way behind him, where the deputy mayor had her head in her hands. Rudy Giuliani, into a microphone that picked up everything he said, said loudly, What's his name? Who is he? And now the titters of laughter in the crowd turned to a little bit louder laughter, and some of the Hall of Fame players seated behind me gave me pats of consolation on my shoulder. Fran Ryder screamed, Keith Olbermann from ESPN, the MC. You repeated it to me. Giuliani turned back to the crowd as if there had been no way they could have heard or seen any of this. And he said, so let me turn it over to a good friend of mine and a great baseball man, Keith Olbermann, our NC from ESPN. I just sat there. More laughs, more consolation from the players behind me. I can still hear the laugh of the late Detroit Tigers great Al Kaline rising above the others. Al later came over to commiserate. As I thought, should I get there and say, thank you, Mayor Dinkins? Or better yet, thank you, Mayor LaGuardia? I then concluded, no, I can't do that. I'm representing ESPN. I'm representing the Baseball Hall of Fame. As I thought that, he said it again. So now I got up and I told the crowd, sorry, I wasn't sure he meant me. So if you are saying to yourself, what on earth happened to Rudy Giuliani with that brown schwitz pouring down his face? I am saying to you, he has been this crazy for at least 30 years. You were just lucky enough to have not previously noticed. It is all true, or my name ain't Keith Obelman, our NC from ESPM. <laughs> done all the damage i can do here thank you for listening to it five episodes a week again posting nightly just after midnight eastern follow me for the podcast promo videos too on tiktok youtube facebook twitter x instagram and tick you once again there is a monday countdown please forward this podcast which was not the monday countdown to well forward it to anybody really i don't i don't care at this point once it leaves here It's not my responsibility who listens to it or what they do after they listen to it. Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel, who do not share my opinion in that, are the musical directors of Countdown, and they arranged, produced, and performed most of our music, which is what musical directors should do. Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards. Mr. Ray was on the guitars, bass, and drums, and it was produced by TKO Brothers, which was Brian's idea to represent me and him and John Philip Chanel. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by the best baseball stadium organist ever, Nancy Faust. The sports music is the Olderman theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Other music arranged and performed by No Horns Allowed. It dawns on me that the number of musical staffers on Countdown exceeds the number of editorial staffers on Countdown by a whole lot. See, there's Brian and John and Nancy... And then there's Mitch Warren Davis from ESPN. That's four. And I'm trying to remember, I believe there were five guys in No Horns Allowed. That's nine musical staffers and the one editorial guy, me. And I'm also part of TKO Brothers. So it's actually 10 to one. Oh, wait, there's another editorial employee. My announcer today was my friend, Kenny Main. Thanks for standing with me, Kenny. It's 10 to two. Everything else, of course, was pretty much my fault. So... 
That's Countdown for today, one week until the 2024 presidential election, the 1,393rd day since convicted felon dissociative fugue J. Trump got away with his first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. So if you can do your math, if it's seven days till the election, and this is day 1393 since the coup attempt, the election day is 1,400 days even since January 6th. All right. Use the election. Use the mental health system. Use presidential immunity to keep him from doing it again while we still have a chance. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news requires. Until the next one, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good night. And good luck. <laughs>